In this lecture, I'll discuss the development of social complexity. First, I'll start with the discussion of subsistence strategies in two main divisions, food collectors and food producers. From there, I'll move into a discussion of domestication and sedatism and talk about the driving force behind domestication as well as some of the positive and negative impacts of sedentism. From there, I'll go into discussion of social complexity, define it, evidence for social complexity, and then the reasons for social complexity. In terms of subsistence strategies, there are two main divisions, food collectors and food producers. Under the food collectors, you have small scale and complex foragers depending on the environmental resources which are present. In terms of food producers, you have both herders as well as farmers, and farmers engaged in a number of different activities from extensive all the way to mechanized industrial agriculture. Food collectors. Food collectors uh, can either be small scale foragers where you have harsher climate with sparser resources and therefore more frequent migrations in order to make the seasonal round. On the other hand, complex foragers have more plentiful food availability and more permanent settlement. An example of this would be the Natufian culture who relied on wild gazelles as well as wild grains or the Klingit of the northwest coast of North America. In terms of food producers, you have pastoralists who are involved in herding animals, and this can be loosely herding animals and following animals over rather extensive areas. So th this population would inherently be non-sedentary or, or staying in one place over a long period of time. The three main types of agriculture are extensive, intensive, and mechanical industrial agriculture. Extensive agriculture relies on slash and burn. Shifting these are shifting agriculture techniques which are used to clear lands for farm plots and tend to be exhausted after a few years. The burning releases essential nutrients which is uh, essential for farming including nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate or phosphorus. And uh, this becomes uh, available for a few short years before the soils are depleted through uh, the crops themselves. Intensive agriculture, uh, here you are utilizing less land to grow more food um, you're using more in terms of technology, in terms of plows, irrigation, draft animals, um, natural fertilizers for farming uh, that tends to yield higher uh, food surpluses. And then mechanical industrial agriculture, this would be farming or animal husbandry, which is modeled as an industry. And this is what we would see in things like confined animal feeding operations or many of the operations across the Great Plains of the United States which rely on very intensive methods and monocultures of crops overall. There's much discussion in archaeology and beyond whether domestication was an accidental or deliberate process. Many anthropologists would argue that humans were sufficiently sophisticated by the period of the Pleistocene in order to select plants for domestication based on convenience, taste, and nutrition. They assert that to claim otherwise uh, does not give due credit to early foragers who experimented with plants who are most likely women. This is part of a larger debate uh, in anthropology and beyond with the man the hunter or women the gatherer hypothesis as the driving force of human evolutionary history. In terms of domestication, how do we know this is actually taking place? In the archaeological record, there are four main characteristics or evidence of animal domestication in the archaeological record. First, finding remains that are not indigenous to the area. That is, these animals have been potentially moved into the area. They did not inhabit the area originally, and all of a sudden you see a, a, the animals are present in the archaeological record. Second, a change in physical features of the animals, mostly to uh, decrease the defensive mechanism of said animals in order to allow them uh, to be easier controlled by humans. Uh, third, an increase in the number of specific animal species compared to other animals of that particular environment, uh, potentially indicating that they were selected for uh, by human beings at the time. Finally, age and sex of fossilized bones will follow patterns of domestication where you tend to see females who are kept around for longer periods of time due to the multiple functions, including reproduction, milk, eggs, that they uh, have uh, in relation to males who tend to be cold uh, much earlier. So what were some of the driving forces behind domestication? There are two main theories here, the broad spectrum foraging theory, which stresses environmental change brought on by the end of the last ice age, resulting in much smaller animals. Um, here you see more options for food. And it, uh, the thing to keep in mind here is that it does not apply to all regions uh, across uh, the world. The other major idea is the notion of social factors, and this is Bender's work um, looking at clinging and potlatching and ritual feasting, competitive 
uh, gastronomic events where large uh, quantities of goods were assembled and then um, distributed um, overall. Overall, archaeologists do not favor a universal framework for explaining domestication because there are too many regional factors overall. And so what they've come up with is this multiple strand theory which uses local effects of climate, environment, population, technology, social organization, and diet in order to explain domestication. So here it's really a mix of both social as well as ecological factors as a whole. In terms of world domestication, we see domestication occurring uh, unevenly across the globe. Uh, particularly look at the divide between the so-called New World of the Americas and the so-called Old World constituting Africa, uh, Europe, and Asia. Uh, in particular, one of the theorists that has uh, done his work off of this is Jared Diamond's work. This is uh, fairly well known in popular press, uh, particularly his book Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, Diamond maintains that, in fact, the close association with animals allowed for disease resistance to confer upon old world populations. Of course, this was at a tremendous cost to human life with things such as the bubonic plague. However, when old world populations came into contact with new world populations, the spread of disease occurred rather rapidly, allowing for what Diamond refers to as the relatively easy conquest of new world populations by old world populations. Human-animal relationship has changed quite a bit over time. Dogs uh, are the earliest uh, known animals to be domesticated and served as our early hunting companions. Certainly in the cultural sphere today, they've gone through many different transformations in terms of how they've been regarded. Two, we see sheep and goats that are present in many agricultural locations. Uh, Meadow uh, maintains that there are six stages in the human-animal relationship as a whole, from random hunting to factory farming. And this, of course, fundamentally shifts the relationship not only in terms of the physical relationship between the animals, uh, other animals and human beings, but also, in fact, the ideological underpinnings of said relationship. And Meadow maintains that herding represents a major shift in worldview overall. One of the things that the contact between the New World and the Old World did was it created a food revolution, where you see an exchange between New World and Old World foods, uh, including the development of what we would see as many contemporary cuisines today. In terms of agricultural dependency, there are many issues with this, a greater dependency, interdependency of people to plants. The diet across the world became less uh, varied, and this is Jared Diamond's work, which is featured on Bolt as one of your readings, and it talks about the idea of the real uh, nutritional consequences for human beings of this um, shift overall. Ecologically, we see deforestation, loss of native plant species, as well as greater exposure to disease, particularly with cutting of forests, which leads to increase in standing water, uh, which leads to increase in uh, malaria through uh, incidents of malaria through an in increase in population of mosquitoes uh, in the region as a whole. Uh, some theorists would argue that increase in agriculture allowed for the conditions of sedentism to occur. This would be choosing a permanent location based on resources of one place. Some suggest that benefits from this would include uh, protection from food shortages and famine due to larger crop yields, while others would suggest uh, disadvantages with uh, agricultural pests and thieves, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, the issue of malaria. With social complexity, you see privatization of food, surplus production, occupational specialization, and class divisions uh, that are several indicators of social stratification that we can see in the archaeological record. Farmers and foragers use simpler technology because it suited the size of the smaller settlements. With more complex technology, this was needed in order to correspond to larger societies. And so there's an example of the pyramid. Uh, only societies that had stratification of political power and social form could organize the labor that was needed and the occupational specialization that was needed as well to, bury, uh, to, to build these mass infrastructure uh, projects such as the pyramids. Uh, and we can see this across the globe in many different settings with monumental architecture being developed. The monumental architecture, with monumental architecture you see less uniformity uh, in terms of uh, buildings. You see a greater diversity of the status of the people with a greater diversity in the structure itself. And social complexity was uh, readily apparent across the globe as of 5,000 years ago in both the new and the old world as a whole. Additional evidence for our, um, complexity in the archaeological record would include shards and surveys. Uh, if you see small amounts of broken pots, this might indicate a home. However, if you see large amounts in a given area, this might indicate a pottery workshop, indicating, in fact, occupational specialization. We also see power facts. These are artifacts of the elite. Uh, luxury items and massive buildings are a demonstration of power uh, in regimenting hierarchy. And now, uh, 
many of these you will see in a history of the world, uh, the recorded uh, uh, program from BBC. Uh, that's available uh, through a link on Bolt uh, that you're required to look at one of those for discussion coming up. So why do complex societies ever develop? Well, there's a number of different theories, all the way from population pressures to warfare, uh, environmental circumscription, to a Marxist approach with a conflict of interest through social relations. But overall, archaeologists uh, do not agree that there's a universal theory, uh, and they use Maya civilization as an example, where social complexity hinged on several interconnecting factors. So in this lecture, I hope to have provided you with an overview of subsistence strategies, including food collectors and food producers, issues of domestication in terms of the motor of domestication, diseases, sedentism, social complexity defined, uh, evidence that we see for social complexity in the archaeological record, and in fact that there is no one universal theory for why social, com uh, social complexity occurred or the development of complex societies.